All right, so um, our last uh, talk, uh, second talk by Tosh, is uh, stated um, about the people's loading project. Well, this was, uh, I, I could also give the subtitle Mirror of Symmetry and the oh, sorry, yes. And the subtitle would actually be My Life After Tikkun's Love. Uh, <laughs> more like it. It would be very nice to uh, relate um, the this this stuff big algebra back to people's w and i i can imagine that happening so uh, we will be surprisingly in this story also be working with the um, cohomology ring of um, cohomology in uh, of certain varieties uh, which are not unrelated to the boundary space of Higgs bundles um, uh, and we will be looking at its intersection cohomology instead. So very similar, roughly what we did uh, for the perverse filtration. Um, we will also have an, an surprising ring structure on on this cohomology, which is uh, um, uh, which is uh, compatible with the intersection cohomology structures so somehow it be, so it feels like we are working on the p side of something so maybe at the end i will pose this question what's the w side okay. and, and so but so in the whole talk it will be about the moduli space of Higgs bundles and in fact that mirror symmetry picture which i was um, sketching uh, on the in the first talk so now for you it will be less shocking than, than in my recent talks, uh, I just had one slide about this mirror symmetry. It's frozen my screen. Oh, maybe I pushed them. Okay. Um, so very quickly, I recall um, this um, motivation from mirror symmetry, which, uh, um, if you remember, at the very end was. Uh, concentrated on these Hecke and Wilson operators, which had a very nice construction in the group. Anton was explaining in the, in the cohomology of the Higgs moduli space, but we will go back to the, uh, at least in the mirror symmetry origin um, of these operators, where the operators don't directly act on the cohomology, they actually act higher up, say on coherent sheets on on these modulus, Higgs moduli spaces. So let me remind you, and so notation is going to change from the first talk because the letter M, which is going to be overused, as you will see, usually it's the letter H because of cogen, cogen, etc. But somehow here the letter M is overused. So I have to change the font of the moduli space because it will turn out to be less important in this talk. So as, as I recall what we were uh, discussing in the first time, that somehow we have this um, um, classical limit of the mirror symmetry, um, which um, can be formulated um, for um, the moduli space of G Higgs bundles on a curve for a G complex reductive group, and it's Levinas dual. So in a classical limit, uh, we should get an equivalence, some sort of equivalence of derived categories, which we denote by S, uh, showing the origin of this uh, from physics, the S duality in four dimensional Younger's theory. Um, also, these derived categories have to be probably enhanced uh, as we learned from geometric lens. So it's, it's, it's a very schematic idea, uh, but definitely generically, um, somehow, um, on a nice locus of the Hitching vibration, it should just be Kuri-Bukai transform along the Hitching vibration. So let me recall that if we have uh, the level zero group, then the its Hitching map will have a Hitching base which can be identified with the Hitching base for HG. So we will have um, these uh, Lagrangian per, uh, proper vibrations over the same base and the generic fibers uh, are abelian varieties which are dual to each other. So it makes sense to think about relative fully mukai transform. And that is going to be your guiding principle of trying to guess or conjecture what are the mirrors of various um, objects on the two sides. And the other um, guiding principle will be this symmetry. 
uh, which I mentioned already. So let's just recall it. And today, eventually, it will be important to take more complicated hacker operators than the ones which we had seen in, in the two of equals W or in the first part. As so here, we will just take simple, um, what I call fundamental or, or elementary hacker modifications. But in fact, you can do a hacker modification uh, for any um, of, of a type labeled by um, um, an irreducible representation of the log of your group. So this is G check um, at the point C. So we fix the point C and the type of the hacker transformation. And then we should have, similarly to the previous um, talk of in Antons, we should have a correspondence, this space H, um, which uh, is uh, mapping both to both MGs. Um, and the idea is that somehow hacker operator should be a pullback and push forward. Okay, but that's technically not really well defined as we mentioned because uh, these hacker transformations don't preserve stability. So it's just a schematic thing we should uh, think about. Again, today's talk, we will, um, I mean, we will have the moduli space, the stable ones, but somehow the stability issue will be not, not important, not really important. Excuse me, and um, uh, upstairs, uh, I believe that uh, the categories of coherent sheets and, uh, and downstairs, is it also about uh, coherent sheets for uh, so this DP? Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Here, here it is just coherent sheets, am I right? Coherent homodules, the right categories of homodules. Yes, that's the first uh, approximation. But there yes, are... yes, first, first approximation. But, but downstairs it is for uh, already already for T modules or something like this. Or no, no T modules. Here. Oh, it should be the same case. Ah, same case. Okay. No, this is the classical limit. Okay. So you should somehow generalize from what you know to this uh, much more symmetric situation where we now okay. only. Ah, it's hidden. Oh, sorry, sorry. It's yeah. only his struggles yeah. uh, from now on. Yeah. Although at the very end, we will surprisingly see that the big algebra also comes from your kind of uh, the geometric elements, which has to be the, what you know, the D module stuff. But then I don't understand the relationship. Here in this talk, everything will be coherent chief on the module space of Higgs protons. Um, and then the hacker transformations uh, will work on this Higgs sense. So we will do a hacker transformation of the vector bundle, but we will also want the Higgs field to preserve that hacker transformation so that I can push it on the other side. Uh, so this is kind of hard geometrically, non trivial uh, correspondence. Main difficulty will be for more complicated views that the space of hacker transformations will be singular. That will really be the technical difficulty. But this other operator, the Wilson operator, actually just like in Anton's um, the previous talk, uh, is much easier to, to define. It's just that's only with the line model that we tell you now because we are more general representations of the group. Now it's important to remember, no, I'm not saying it here, but that means that here E is the E check is thought to be the universal G check bundle over the moduli space of G duo, uh, G check um, Higgs bundles times the curve. So we first restrict to, to this given point on the curve. So now I have a principal G check bundle on the um, moduli space. And now I can take the associated vector bundle in the representation given by this, uh, this uh, dominant. Uh, co-character or character for G, G check. So that's a well-defined vector bundle. It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful geometry. It has this trichromatic structure. So this is exactly the kind of things we would like to see in, uh, I understand it's mirror in mirror symmetry. And, and what I was uh, telling you uh, yesterday that Kapustin and Witten, and in fact, I mean, basically, uh, so in some in that story, you have this intertwining of these uh, uh, operators with the, with the SQLT. So let me show you the simplest test of this. And that's basically what we are going to test and see what mathematical structures we can cook out of it. So we will just 
look at this uh, intertwining equation and apply it to the simplest uh, coherent chief I can imagine on the, the, the Lagrange dual moduli space. So uh, what is uh, this? This is a structure shift. So, so the good thing about structure shift is that if you very nicely fit both with this uh, intertwining, but also with the, the ideas about generally generally free and quite transform. Let me show you how. So we will want to compute what's the Hecker transform of the uh, mirror of the structure sheet. The first thing, using the ideas of free and quite transform, we can convince ourselves that we want the structure sheet to be mirror to what? So then you recall about free and quite transform that the structure sheet the Fourier Mukoi transform, which is the skyscraper sheet, and the identity element of the dual opinion variety. So now we do this relative in a family over the Hitching base. So we expect uh, that the mirror object here, the relative Fourier Mukoi transform, should also be, um, it turns out, the structure sheet of this collection of all the identity elements of the Legless dual teaching vibration. And in fact, there is a beautiful um, section of the teaching vibration, which is also called the uh, teaching section, which we will recall in, in, the, in the example case we will be studying later. So you have a teaching section which picks out exactly the identity element in the Legless dual teaching vibration. And that's the input from putting quite just what we expect the mirror of the structure sheaf. This will be the notation for the. Um, oh, now we are in the original G. That's why we don't have check here. So this is the hitching section in the G. The its structure sheaf. This should be uh, the mirror of this, uh, the structure sheaf of the whole uh, moduli space. So that's one side. So one side we are going to study the Hecke transformations of the hitching section, and on the other side, if we compute this uh, by using the intertwining property, then we would first have to use the um, Wilson operator on the structure sheet, but that is just uh, the vector of the itself. So we know that this uh, should be just this vector bundle, the universal bundle in the Romeo representation, and it's minimal. So when you put this together, what you get is that the mirror of the universal bundle at that point in the universe, in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, that irreducible representation should have a mirror, which is the Hecke transformation of the Hitching section. Okay, so that's the right hand side is a nice, we understand the, the coherent shift completely coming from the universal bundle. Now we want to understand its mirror. And now we are uh, reduced to understand how Hecke transformations move the Hitching section. And basically, uh, this is a big part of what we are going to study how to understand the Hecke transform Hitching section. And uh, first, I just say it to motivate what you will see on the next slide. One nice thing about um, the uh, Hecke transform the Hitching section, two nice things is that the Hecke operators are Lagrangian operators. So the teaching section, as you will see, is a Lagrangian sub variety. So it is always meant to be taken to a Lagrangian. And then, second, is that because the teaching section will be invariant under a natural cis direction, so will be the, the Hecke transformed ones. And it turns out that those will be um, the Hecke transforms, will be coherent sheets, but they will have a support. Uh, at, at a union of certain Lagrangian upward flows. So I'm going to now tell you about these Lagrangian upward flows, which are very natural uh, source, very natural Lagrangians on the moduli space of Higgs bundles. And one of them, and you already mentioned, is the Higgs section, which is crucial in, for many uh, applications. And But there are many, many more. In fact, it will be um, um, paving also the good word, um, uh, partitioning the Hitching moduli space into these, into all these Lagrangian upward flows. So how does that go? Uh, we will uh, first special, specialize in this case uh, so that it's uh, simpler and we can be more concrete. So we will take the PGLM 
fix when you in space. So we will be looking at the point in the pigeon and Higgs when you in space, a pigeon and Higgs bundle is a pair of a Rankine vector bundle and a, a trace free Higgs field, which is, a, you should think, is a one point value endomorphism of the vector bundle of trace zero. And because it's PGL, you should think that there is an equivalence relation um, by tensor and midline bundles. So that uh, represents a point of the PGL module space. Now we are in a stable module space, so it should also produce a stability condition, etc. And then we have the Hitching map, which in this case takes a very simple form. Um, uh, we will, um, I told you in the general story, we just take the, um, the finization of the Hitching map, and you can show it's equivalent with, uh, with this uh, proper Hitching map, which in this case you can just take by um, computing the characteristic polynomial of the Higgs field. So the Higgs field at any point of the curve is just an endomorphism of a vector space, it's a matrix and with values in the canonical bundle. And then when we evaluate its uh, characteristic polynomial, then we will have the coefficients. Which uh, will leave uh, will be sections of these uh, powers of the chemical um, bundle. We will don't have the first one because the trace was zero, but we will have all the other coefficients. And so at the end of the day, if the base is going to be this uh, vector space, it's really just a C star uh, acted uh, alpha space, but it turns out to be a vector space, but you can really add six fields. And uh, it also has uh, crucially half of the dimension is the moving space of Higgs bundles, uh, the total space. Uh, and then with respect to a natural symplectic structure, we will have a, and uh, this will be a completely integrable system. Um, but besides all these structures, beautiful structures of the ancient we will have one more geometrical structure to think about, namely a natural C star action, uh, which will just be scaling the Higgs field by a non-zero complex number. And, and then it's clearly will uh, preserve uh, um, stability so it acts on homogeneous space. And this action has a very nice property, which uh, that it is semi-projective, which actually you can prove basically from the properness of the Higgs map. It has so the C star equivariance of that map. So C star will act in a non trivial way on the base, it's being two, three, etc., n on those factors, uh, but it will have a unique fixed point on the base. And because of that, we will be able to deduce that the fixed point set of the C star action will have to be in included in the zero fiber of the Hitching map. Um, and therefore, it has to be projecting itself because the map is projecting. And, and the second property which you make it semi projecting is that it's um, um, it's attracting in the sense that if you have any point on your space, then the C star orbit will have a limit point at, uh, at zero. Not necessarily at infinity, that would be the case for a projective variety, but this direction you can always close down your C star orbits. And then you could, can do that, then you have a natural way to. Um, partition the space because now we can to any fixed point of the six direction we can collect all those Higgs bundles which uh, flow into that um, Higgs bundle by collecting those F such that the limit is is or given E and we will say that this collection of Higgs bundles is uh, the upward flow uh, from E so these are downward flows from F then down to E we will think of this as from E the upward flow. And then there is a beautiful theory, uh, due to be a long time ago, 1973, that shows uh, two majorly important things for us. One is that this uh, subset is actually a locally closed subvariety. And second, it is a isomorphic to a vector space in a C star equivalent way. And the vector space is easy to uh, describe. It's just the tangent space to the fixed point uh, of the sister action E, uh, where we pick out the positive weights of the action. There will be the zero weights on the fixed point component, there will be negative weights, so we discard out and we keep on the positive weights. And therefore, we see that 
as a um, C star space, it will be like a vector space with a positive action, positive uh, derivative action of C star. Um, and then one more property, which is extra to our case, because we have this symplectic structure, which we say is homogeneity one. The C star action rotates the symplectic form by weight one. And from that, you can deduce that all these upward flows are Lagrangian. So this way you have a beautiful partition of the modulus space into, into Lagrangian upward flows. And so here is the this formula because of semi projectivity, every element will live in one of these upward flows. So you have this partition. And now comes the crucial option for the first part of the talk, where I will be studying only certain type of um, upward flows, which are somehow higher, highest up in a natural partial ordering of these upward flows. You can say that one upward flow is below another one if uh, the, the lower one is not closed, but it will have a limit point at infinity, that starting point of the next upward flow. That will give us a uh, partial ordering and the maximum element with respect to this partial ordering will be the ones where the upper flow is closed. So those play an, a very special role. Um, they will be, you will see, also in, related to minus Q representations on the other side of the mirror symmetry. So um, then you can have uh, several equivalent properties of being very stable. Uh, one of them is that uh, the map, um, the Hitchin map restricted to this closed uh, subarchy then is also proper, but it's actually equivalent. So this will be uh, closed if and only the restricted map is proper. And now these are very special maps. So you have two vector spaces of the same dimension with C star acting on both with positive weights and the map is proper. So from this, you can deduce beautiful uh, results. For example, that uh, the map has to be even finite and flat. The, all the fibers, uh, skin theoretically speaking, will have the same uh, length. Um, and so over zero, it's only zero which goes to zero. So the pre-image of zero is just the point zero. But because of what I said about flatness, we will have a, a non-trivial thickness to the skin theoretical fiber over zero, which will have the same length as the generic fiber. And, and it turns out that there is an exciting and, and really amazing structure to this zero dimension of schemes. And geometrically speaking, what we are thinking about, and then there's something we could have thought about 20 years ago when I wrote my PhD, I was looking at these upward flows. You have the upward flow, these guys will intersect the zero fiber in a single point, namely in E. That's what it means to be very stable and not equivalent uh, and definition. And, and then the scheme theoretical intersection will be uh, very interesting to study. We will do, say, a few words on this later. And for now, let me just formulate this as one side or, uh, problem, but with the Nigel Hitchin, with, which, with whom we started this kind of uh, 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 ideas, we also use this uh, very stable theme of John Paper. Um, one aspect we were interested in trying to understand the Hitchin map on these Lagrangians, but explicitly. So if you think about this, it looks like a very simple map. It's a polynomial map between vector spaces of the same dimension can be find coordinates which are not given so Bielinski Bielina this is not given the canonical coordinates can be find coordinates where this map we can describe explicitly and that's somehow interesting for integrable system theory because that way you could uh, find halfway of the problem of describing the Hitchin map very explicitly Okay, let me show you some simplest examples of very stable Higgs bundles. And the first one will be, of course, what I mentioned already, the Hitchin section. The Hitchin section will turn out to be the most important, um, um, very stable upward flow. So let me then start with the Hitchin section. So the underlying bundle in the PGNI case of the, uh, the Hitchin section is going to be 
always the same fixed uh, vector in all this direction of line bundles like that. So we come up to use knowledge of the chemical bundle. And uh, now we are first describing the, the Higgin section. So for any point in the base, which is uh, um, this uh, characteristic polynomial A, we will be constructing a Higgs bundle, a Higgs field on this vector bundle, which will have this characteristic polynomial. And then if you have, uh, you, you remember your linear algebra class, there is a canonical way to do that. In linear algebra, you can just take the uh, companion matrix, which has precisely the property that if you have the characteristic polynomial as you want it. So this guy, this Higgs field, phi A, will have a characteristic polynomial precisely A. So this is the continuum matrix. And that E0 phi A together for every A will give us this uh, so for uh, each section. And this will be nothing else but the upward flow from a particular example, the one over zero over the origin of the Higgin base that corresponds to nilpotent X fields where the characteristic polynomial is zero. So when the last column is completely zero, then that's a very important Higgs bundle in this um, in, in, our, uh, in our work. It's so-called canonical uniformizing Higgs bundle um, from which the upward flow will be nothing else but the Higgs section. So the upward flow from this will contain all these um, uh, Higgs bundles, and then you can show that it is the full upward flow. Uh, so the upward flow from E0, which will remove E from here. So that's why the notation really is just or following our notation W0 plus is the upward flow from the point of the where so it's on this data section, which then is being a section of the agent that is clearly closed. So it's very stable. It's somehow it's on the top of everything else. So that below it is where, where the agent space is. The near potent cone, this is the top point of the near potent cone. And now we will want to make these Hecke transformations that I promised us. So in the first part of the talk, I will talk about fundamental elementary Hecke modifications. So we will just take a point C on the curve. And first, we just uh, take the Hecke modification of the, this case fundamental Hecke modification of the um, uh, of the underlying bundle, which will just be twisting the last n minus k uh, line bundles with uh, with this uh, OC line bundle OC, and then um, that will be EK. We will denote this EK, and then we will slightly modify these uh, these uh, fixed fields. There, namely the case position, the one we will replace be the section of this line bundle, and maybe the defining section, the one which vanishes precisely at C. So we will introduce one zero at that point C. So that's the new Higgs bundle, which we will call EK. One can check that it is uh, so a stable Higgs bundle. And then you can think about its upward flow. And then, then the first, I mean, we had with Nigel um, some uh, results which uh, in this type one one case and the line bundle is a direct sum of uh, the vector bundle is a direct sum of line bundles it characterizes all the very stable ones and these are some of the most important uh, very stable Higgs bundles of this type so the statement is that these are always very stable okay and the way you can prove this, or maybe philosophically, it was, I mean, the proof was a bit more complicated. Of course, we had a complete classification in this uh, type 1 1 case. But uh, if you just uh, try to think about Hecke modifications, we will do at the point C, and then you want to take uh, a, uh, a K dimensional subspace and do a Hecke modification there, then you can uh, prove that. You can access precisely all points of these more general upward flows. So WK plus U, then all the upward flow from here. Those points are precisely the possible Hecke transformations of the elements of the aging section. In general, this map will be, uh, well, and uh, choose K possibilities we will get uh, generically uh, for the. Um, 
choice of the k-dimensional subspace where we can do the hacker modification. Uh, but anyway, so and then the idea was to prove that this was very stable, is that the Asian section was very stable and somehow the hacker transformation should preserve closeness. That's the rough idea. Um, but again, if you allow fitting to the general story, so we're using the case fundamental character of the seven and the corresponding hacker transformation will be this, and then we can say that we can think that the hacker transformation of region section is precisely this single upward flow. So in the very stable case, we actually just have a single upward flow. And then the thing which corresponds to being very stable is the fact that the fundamental representation of the SLN or the first case, the other case, uh, fundamental person, they are minuscule. And uh, this actually means that they are minimal with respect to um, some natural partial ordering of the um, of the these uh, dominant uh, uh, co-weights and the uh, co-characters and uh, and that's actually basically how you should think about this. We, we will be able to label all these up type one one upward flow somehow with characters and then in this partial geometric partial ordering will reflect the partial ordering of, of dominant weights. So therefore, minus Q uh, weights will correspond to uh, very stable platforms. And so then the first uh, surprise uh, was when we were, so with Nigel, we were uh, understanding these uh, upward flows. And uh, first we understood uh, the C star equivalent character of them. We call that the, the related quantity called the equivalent multiplicity. And we got actually the Poincare polynomial of the Grassmannian. But then it was, a, I couldn't even dare to imagine that the cohomology ring of the Grassmannian will show up, but it does. And it actually not just the cohomology ring, it's the equivalent cohomology ring of the Grassmannian which will be describing these upward flows. So for that, let me quickly recall the uh, notion of equivalent cohomology in this algebraic uh, geometric situation. So we will have a complex reductive group. We will have um, the corresponding classifying principle bundle, the universal principle bundle over the classifying space PG, where G acts on the contractible space EG up to homotopy. It's a well-defined uh, principle G bundle. Um, so the coefficient uh, ring uh, will be the cohomology ring of the classifying space, which is, of course, as important in the characteristic class theory. Um, and it has a beautiful way to compute it. It will be important in both ways that it's, as, it's both the G invariant polynomials on the real algebra, but also the line invariant polynomials on the Cartan subalgebra. Um, we both describe the, this ring. This is a graded ring, the two agrees. And what's uh, geometrically important for us to note, this by Shelley's theorem, this is a polynomial ring. And yes, you will see in a moment that all or equivalent homology rings will leap over this uh, polynomial ring. So now the setup is that we have now a smooth, well, no, some algebraic variety with the action of a complex reductive group. And then we can form this homotopy quotient or border quotient uh, by the diagonal action of G. And we combine the action on X and, uh, and on the inverse of principle bundle. And we will just define the equivalent homology as the uh, homology of this um, border quotient. One important thing is that we can project to the EG mod G in the second factor, you can project. And that will be then the Borel quotient will be a fiber bundle over BG, and the fibers you can identify with the space X itself. But what's important then, you can pull back homology classes from the base. It is actually naturally it receives a map from the homology of the classifying space. And that will be the reason actually we will see more structure to equilibrium homology than ordinary homology because it's an algebra over a much more interesting, geologically much more interesting algebra than just a point or the, the, the field C, we will get this uh, polynomial algebra, positive dimensional uh, polynomial algebra. Um, okay, so 
we will be in the situation always that um, or aquarium homology will be equivalently formal, and that uh, means several things. Uh, one is that you can recover the um, orbital homology of X by uh, by uh, uh, specializing over the uh, over zero in H star G. The, the augmentation idea of H star G you can uh, divide. Uh, or you can tensor uh, your um, your algebra, and that's the specialization at zero. And if something is equivalently formal in the ordinary homology leaves over zero. Or another way to say this is the um, if the ring is a free module over the uh, coefficient ring, okay, it will be a finite free module, and this finite free module will be the analog of finite flat map from the from the Hitching story. Um, and in the case when we don't have even cohomology, the odd cohomology, as will be the case for us, uh, all the examples, basically then it's equivalent to say that the map, the induced map on this FI spectra, so now we have these two FI varieties, the base of the map is the, is just uh, the, the quotient, GIP quotient of T by W, which is now an FI space because of the polynomial ring property of the invariant uh, ring. So where this, you have this finite flat uh, morphism, the spectrum of the equivalent cohomology of the variety. And then- is arbitrary. Hmm? is arbitrary. Yeah, this is a general story. We assume X is equivalently formal. So that these properties hold. Other it could be crazy. The oh, well, that's not this is the useful. Hmm? Okay. You have to assume this, otherwise you don't. I mean, you always have such a map, but this map will not be nice in general. But in the equivalent formal case, for example, when the variety doesn't have hot cohomology, then it will be automatically equivalently formal. So let's assume the varieties that we do get will have no hot cohomology. And then you will get this nice uh, geometrical picture. And the surprise is that you can use this kind of map, which uh, abstractly is uh, similar to the Hitching map on a very stable upward flow. It actually can be used to model the Hitching map on the upward flows we have put there. So on this uh, first uh, minu case, uh, minuscule upward flows, you can use the equivalent cohomology of the Grassmannian of K planes in CN um, to, to model the Hitching map. So, what, what do I mean here? So, I have um, the uh, complex Grassmannian of K planes, which is a homogeneous space uh, for PGLN. So, you have this equivalent cohomology. It turns out to be um, the, the uh, the spectrum is uh, irreducible. It's uh, actually a vector space again, um, and, um, and the base is also a vector space, and, and this has no homology, so it is accurately formal. So this is a finite flat morphism, and it turns out that the or hitching maps on these particular upward flows are also uh, can be modeled by this in the sense that you can just pull back this map. By a natural evaluation map at the point C, you will end up there. And you can just pull back that map and you will get a. Uh, uh, is yeah, it's a full back diagram of this pipe along this map. In that way, you get in some nice sense an explicit or conceptual description of this map as the pullback map of the agrarian college of the Gasmania. Okay, so you might, I, I guess you might see why the Grassmannian, it is here the reason that the Grassmannian parameterizes the possible Hecke transformations that we can do at that point. So at the point C, we have the k dimensional subspaces of the fiber of the vector bundle, where we can attempt to do the Hecke transformation. These, uh, the space of Hecke transformations will be called labeled GR omega K, that's the so-called Fi sugar uh, variety. And this is, um, in our case, is uh, the whole Grassmannian. And then the way to prove uh, this result is to, um, to understand, you start, we start from the H section, 
and we look at the point C, and we will start to look at this uh, smiling or the K planes and see which one of them is preserved by the Higgs field. And there will be along the each section, everything is um, regular. So there will be uh, finitely many such subspaces is preserved. So you will have finitely many choices. And then when you do that in this family, you will compute some fixed point scheme inside the Grassmannian times the Hitching base and the, or the, the that base, and you will uh, turn up turn out to be computing precisely the spectrum of technical homology. There will be soon a paper with a PhD student of mine where we generalize this to more geometrical situations. So this now is a more um, established fact that fixed point schemes, which in this case describe the aging map, is actually isolating in the spectrum of FEIF homology. Um, and now we come back to this original question. Over zero here, by FEIF formality, we have the uh, the cohomology the ring of the Grassmannian is the, the, the ring coordinate ring of that fat point. And that, that was our original observation with Nigel, which was a very nice explanation of just this numerical quantity we computed in the paper, which I mentioned, may have mentioned it was the uh, binomial coefficient n choose k, uh, the q binomial coefficient, which is, we know, the planetary polynomial of the Grassmannian, but this is a beautiful geometric uh, realization of that because this actually is the cohomogeneity of the Grassmannian at that tip point. And so that's why we saw this uh, form of recurrent uh, multiplicity. Okay, so that was the first um, uh, observation. And now we will be thinking about what should we do on the mirror side? What should this equivalent, the spectrum of equivalent cohomology map on the mirror side. You remember that we want the Hecke transform teaching section to become the universal bundle in the corresponding representation, which in this case is the exterior case, exterior power of the universal bundle. And now we will be doing something on that side, inside the representation. We will be endowing the universal bundle with the structure of a bundles uh, of algebra structure using Kirillov algebra. So let me remind you um, this construction of Kirillov from 2000. Um, he attaches to any, um, now we go, it should be G-check, but for simplicity on this line, we have G, but in, morally we are now on the Legans U side, the SNS side in the previous story. So we will take a um, dominant uh, character of, of uh, a highest rate representation of, um, of G. If you act on this vector space V mu, um, and to this scale of attached what you call the fam classical family algebra, I just simplified to Kirillo algebra, um, this algebra, the tensor algebra, the symmetric algebra on G with the um, endomorphisms of the representation, which is G. Um, Invariant, so G acts on both sides. Okay, so that's some algebraic definition. Um, for me and geometer, I like to first uh, identify G with G star because then the symmetric algebra can be thought of as polynomial functions on G itself. And we, we can do this in our case, G will be here, and where G will be a simple group. So we have a, we can identify G with G star. And then these things can be just thought of as polynomial maps from the V algebra to endomorphisms of the, the representation matrices, really. So you should think of an element in the Kirill algebra is a matrix acting on the representation where the entries are polynomials on the V algebra. But now everything is G invariant. Uh, so G acts on the representation, and G also acts on, on G, and we have to have a G equivalent um, polynomial map from G to N V nu. Okay, so that's a little bit more explicit what these uh, elements in the Kirillov algebra are. So first thing to notice that if you have just a, okay, again I, I already changed it to G star. Um, if you have a um, invariant polynomial on the algebra, then you can just uh, multiply such a 
polynomial function pointwise um, by a scalar, and it will, of course, be the Fitzgerald variant. It will use the preserved G equivariance. So, this algebra, which is nothing else but the coefficient algebra, the cohomology of the classifying space, is um, it's going to act over this. It maps there, and this is such an algebra, associative H star G algebra. But in general, it will, it's not commutative, and this will be crucial. Uh, later, the case is when it is not commutative, but for us, in the first part, where we will look at the very stable case, it will be commutative. It was one of the first results of Kirillov, who showed that the, uh, this algebra is uh, commutative if and only if the representation is uh, weight multiplicity free. So if you take all the weights of the maximum torus, then every weight multiplicity will be one. In particular, one of the most important example for us is when the representation is minuscule, then the algebra will be commutative. And in that case, one can use in the cases here, the, when we will do the minuscule case, for G equals SLN, it's just the fundamental representations. We can use this Kirillov algebra structure to build a bundle of algebra structure on our universal bundle along the H section. So how do we do this? So first, we can see that at the point C of the universal bundle, uh, we are going to have a, a vector bundle over the, um, the H section. At every point, I just have this uh, vector space on which at that point, uh, I will have a, uh, I will have a point in the base of the Kirillov algebra, I will have a morphism from G to, to there. I will have a matrix acting on this, so I can uh, act in this Kirillov algebra on that uh, vector space at that, at that over that point. In that way, I can embed the Kirillov algebra into the endomorphism algebra of this bundle. And now, what's not trivial is that this section is. Um, and important, it's very, uh, this, this algebra is very nice. It's what I call cyclic algebra. This means that uh, applying this to the identity vector or some vector here, it will generate the whole vector space. So you can actually identify the Kirillov algebra uh, with the underlying vector space itself. And using that identification, you can build a multiplication on the, um, on all these vector spaces on this vector bundle. And you will get a bundle of algebra structure on the universal bundle over the uh, teaching section, whose uh, relative spectrum will be the same as the spectrum of the Kirillov algebra. Again, Kirillov algebra in all cases is commutative. I can take its spectrum, and it will be the, the, over the spectrum of the base. And it turns out that this is the right mirror picture to the uh, to the one we had seen on the other side on the on the previous slide. Um, but what's uh, just a few words? How you construct this bundle of algebra structure? We are using uh, in this case of the commutative case certain so-called M operators of Kirillo, and one just applies those operators to the uh, Higgs field we have. So the Higgs field you should think about uh, at every point the Higgs field is just an element of the Lie algebra. And so I can use the Kirillov operator to map it to an endomorphism of the um, of the corresponding representation. And that's how you can build um, endomorphisms there. And then uh, you will use the cyclic property of the algebra, which is going to be crucial. This was proved by Panyushan in the case of the Kirov algebra for the multiplicity representations. And so, just a side remark that when k equals one, this construction of a bundle of algebra structure appears in the um, uh, BNR correspondence. When you hook up the spectral curve, you actually use the, this uh, simplest bundle of algebra structure on E, and then you take the relative spectrum. Uh, you uh, 
you can then there be down the C dependence, you can actually hook up the, um, the spectrum of them this way. But let's not go into that. What's important, by the way, if you can generalize the BNR correspondence to, well, at this point, to any minuscule representation, but later to any minuscule representation of the group. So now let me conclude uh, the first part by showing you how the two sides fit together. I want to convince you that this observation of the Hitching map on the minuscule upward flow model uh, model by the Aquarian conjugate Grassmannian is is mirror to the uh, description of this bundle of algebra structure on the universal bundle. So what I remind you again is this observation is starting with coming from the intertwined property that the mirror of the universal bundle in this representation should be the Hecke transform kitchen section. Um, and now we are in our situation with GSPGLM, and the mu is a fundamental representation. In that case, the Hecke transform kitchen section is actually just the, the structure sheaf of a submarine. So in itself, it has extra structure. You can multiply its sections because it's a structure sheet of something. So it's a sheaf of algebras. And then now you can think about what happens to a sheaf of algebras when you do fully Markov transform for that. I mean, you can multiply sections, but of course, it will when you take fully Markov transform, it will not give you multiplication. It will relate the convolution of the of the fully Markov transform thing with itself. But over zero uh, is the only place where convolution is actually. Um, mapping um, zero uh, and zero to itself, you will get a sheet of algebra structure. And that's uh, comes somehow the heuristic, which says that the sheet of algebra should have a mirror which restricts to the hissing pitching section to the identity elements in the Fourier equation transform as a sheet of algebra or algebra. So in our case, it will be a vector bundle, the mirror say it will be a bundle of algebra. So that's the motivation to seek um, this bundle of algebra structure on the universal uh, Higgs bundle on the dual teaching section. So I just write this argument out here. Um, right. So that somehow, again, we use this um, um, heuristic we have from, from knowing that we are doing some sort of frame uh, quake transform. And then you get to be completely identify the two, these two sides of the mirror symmetry. So here you see our construction of the bundle of algebra structure here, uh, modeled on the Kirin of algebra. On the other side, you see our modeling of the upward flow with the, uh, with the um, equivalent ecology of the Grassmannian. And we need one more input, which was also Observed by Panyushev, although it's an important distinction that Panyushev proved that the um, um, the the Kirill algebra for a minuscule representation is the equivalent cohomology of the cominuscule uh, variety or of the minuscule uh, flag variety, but we actually will go to the Langlands dual side and we will be taking the Cominuscule flag variety. In the GRDAD case, it's actually the same, it's always the Grassmannian, so it's more blurred there. But basically, when you should work on this side, but actually, what this theory shows us that we should actually work on the Lenglands your side, and instead of taking the, uh, um, the cominuscule flag variety on this side, you should take the minuscule flag variety on the other side, which in type A. D and uh, E is the same, but you have some interesting examples there, which are minuscule but not minuscule, and vice versa in the other types, G and C types. Okay, and then you have the isomorphism of the uh, spectrum of um, or the or the Kirillov algebra with the equivalent cohomology of the Grassmannian, and you can use this to to match what you want in uh, that the um, Upward flow can be understood as the spectrum of the um, relative spectrum of this bundle of algebra on the other side. So that's um, the first part of the talk, which um, already gives some 
a surprising uh, appearance of the Akhenan cohomology of the Grossmannian. There are so these um, Kirillov algebras. But what I will talk about in the second part is, um, is how to generalize this to non very stable, non minuscule uh, weights, more general than just weight multiplicity free, any way. And we will see that. Okay, this picture is not yet completed in the other side, but we will be able to uh, we will be able to find very interesting algebras here. They will be called the big algebras. And let me just say to finish the first part that you can somehow consider this generalized story that is geometrically as some sort of classical limit of the geometry of Stockholm isomorphism. So that's the first part. And Thank you. Okay, great. Um, question? No. Uh, so then, um, this is the uh, 15 minute break. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, the second one should be short. Yeah. And then it'll be shorter. Yeah. Shorter, I hope. Yes. And then, and then completely local. Basically. Well, we should have a point on the curve. So we have the infinitism, yes, yeah. so we are at that point of the curve. So somehow the genus doesn't say, doesn't do much. We somehow factor out when we, right? There is no genus doesn't show up on the, in the models. But of course there is a genus here, it's a very large vector space. Uh, but this one shows that okay, most of the directions here are uninteresting where on the pier is, uh, is the same. In the in the in the what the one of the action. Okay, so last uh, bit of these two days, uh, Thomas will give his last. Right. So what I'm going to do will be hopefully much faster than the first part. I will just uh, tell you what how can one generalize this picture, partly conjecturally to any. Um, dominant uh, coates, not just the minuscule ones. And um, that will be given by these big algebras, which uh, I have recently uh, been studying. So let me remind you this, the, where these uh, big algebras should lead, what properties they should have, and why we are interested in them. So uh, the setup is this. We have an irreducible representation now we work on with SLM of SLM, of um, not necessarily big multiplicity free representation. And, and uh, because of Kirillov's result, this uh, Kirillov algebra is typically not going to be commutative. So it's some non-commutative associative algebra. Uh, but for us, in order for the mirror symmetry to match the two sides, you, could not, you can ask this, what is the uh, mirror of the universal uh, bundle in the, in this particular representation. Well, we know by the this intertwining property it should be the Hecke transform of the structure sheet of the Hitchin section. And then if you think about how you construct uh, roughly the, the that uh, Hecke transform, you do this uh, Hecke correspondence and you pull back and push forward. The point is that this bundle of uh, the sheet of algebra structure you have on the H section, you will preserve. You will pull back a sheet of algebras, you will push forward. You should get a sheet of algebra structure on this Lagrangian support. Um, and, and that's the reason we expect the sheet of algebra structure, uh, bundle of algebra structure on the universal bundle uh, in that representation. And that at the end, we will want to have, as we did before, we want to have the commutative subalgebra of the Kirillov algebra, which is which is cyclic. And uh, that will be our aim to find the big algebra. We will call it the big algebra, a commutative and cyclic subalgebra of the Kirillov algebra. It looks like I it seems in the simplest case, which is non-trivial, in, in the case of SL3 and the adjoint representation, we understand the Kirillov algebra explicitly. And so Kirillov had uh, two students working on this Kirillov algebra. And there you can see that there is a unique such commutative and cyclic subalgebra. 
And interestingly, the students did not study this commutative subalgebra. Um, um, okay. Sorry, what was cyclic? Hmm? What was the meaning of cyclic? Uh, okay, this is uh, first just um, on a vector space, a matrix, commuting matrix algebra is cyclic. cyclic if there is a vector in the vector space, yeah. so that you get the whole uh, vector space. Um, um, and this way, you will be able to have an isomorphism um, between the algebra. It's a definite dimensional algebra with the vector space itself. And then, um, yes. And when does the algebra act? So, there is a cyclic vector. It Where will act on the representation, right? It's always act on the representation. What we will have is just the identity element there. There is a one there, and we will let the algebra act, and we should get back the base times the vector space we knew. The, the way how it acts. But uh, you need to pick an element in, in V mu, but V mu has a one, I mean, the highest they say. But, and then what, what do you pick in SLM? Or, because your endomorphisms are functions, so you have maps from SLM to the endomorphisms. Yes, but I think at every point you can take just the highest way. Mu, it yes. will be over every point, this will be a cyclic algebra. And uh, I think we can just say the highest weight at every point. Every point of what? Over the you know, it's a morphism from the Lie algebra to the. So over every point, I have a finite dimensional matrix algebra acting on that vector space we knew at every point of the Lie algebra, every point of the Lie algebra. Mm -hmm. And this, all of them will be cyclic at the same time. And, uh, and I think I just take the highest weight vector and they will generate the vector space. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Okay, and so let me now tell you the hints which I had uh, got before I came up with the, with the construction of the big algebra. So these are two PhDs of um, students of um, Kirillov. So the first one had this uh, explicit computation of the Kirillov algebra for the adjoint representation of SL3. And there you could actually find by inspection such a big uh, algebra. This, by the way, because of commutativity and cyclicity, it will be maximal. So that's why I call it big. It's uh, one of these maximal uh, commutative subalgebras. And so you could see that it exists there. But more interestingly, Ty brought down that um, for any simple lead, the algebra, he wrote down in the adjoint representation the Kirillov algebra. Sorry, it should be on the top, but okay. Um, um, and, and then in his description, he has some operators which commute with each other, and he actually uh, writes down the monomial basis, and you can see in there that those operators will generate the cyclic subalgebra because the dimension meshes the, 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 the dimension of the Lie algebra, but again, he does not study this subalgebra. But you can see it in those examples where you can actually have a complete uh, description of the of the Kirillov algebra. You can buy it, and and I believe that it's a unique uh, one. So it looks like this will be a unique subalgebra. But um, that was one of the hints. So that I had uh, more than half a year ago. In these cases, I had a subalgebra which should be the one we need. Uh, but the second hint was. Uh, that we had some operators in the Kirillov algebra which were explicitly understandable. And uh, these are these M operators of Kirillov, which I will show you on the next slide. And Kirillov shows that they are in the center, and it turns out that they are actually the center. So we have the center of the algebra. Any maximal subalgebra will contain the center. So these op operators should be in whatever uh, maximal commutative subalgebra we want. And we will see how the M operators are defined by Kirillov. And there already there is a guess what might be the right algebra. But also back then I was, uh, I forgot the precise order of things, but I was already reading about the Nishchenko for my co integrable systems, which are now uh, Poisson uh, commuting algebras on the Lie algebra or the dual of the Lie algebra. And they are also obtained by. Uh, successive differentiation of uh, of invariant polynomials, exactly the thing which we will be doing here. 
And uh, so that these are somehow the, the hints. And now I, I show you my first, which was first just a guess, but it looked very good from, from many angles. So now I tell you the construction of the big algebra. In these elementary terms, the original way how I, I worked with them. So this is how Kirillov defined his um, M operators uh, in concrete coordinates. So he took some coordinates for SLM, and then the dual coordinates are the dual basis with respect to the healing form. And then he just wrote down a differential D operator like this. It's not really a differential operator in that it's not doesn't satisfy any sort of Leibniz rule. You sum together the differential, the derivative of the original element in the Kirillov algebra. Again, you should think of the Kirillov algebra as a matrix with entries from polynomials on the D algebra. So you can differentiate all the entries in one direction in the in the Lie algebra and multiply the Stolten matrix with the matrix given by the um, the dual element in the representation and you sum these things together. That was his definition. He did show that and that this will land in the Kirillov algebra G invariant, and he showed that if you took an invariant polynomial. Uh, and you differentiated that. So, for example, for SLM, we will take uh, the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial. It amazingly will turn out for the general story, it matters which basis of um, invariant polynomials we take. Um, well, for Kirillov's business, it was not necessary, but anyway, so we take some basis elements of the invariant polynomials in the D algebra, and then we will differentiate it. Uh, and that these are Kirillov's M operators. Kirillov, we call them medium operators. That's the overuse of the letter M starts to be here. And then we will generate all the, um, the this subalgebra of the uh, Kirillov algebra, which, uh, as I'm saying, Kirillov showed it's in the center of the algebra, but actually you can show that it's the whole center. So you have a nice explicit way to describe the center of this algebra. And now, if you got this in from Mischenko Fomenko system, or otherwise, you can just guess maybe differentiating it further. It, it decreases the degree of the uh, genus. So the, the polynomials have some degree, and you start to differentiate, you get smaller and smaller degree uh, um, elements in the and in this graded Kirillov algebra. And you have these operators of uh, HK, I call them in degree I minus K. These are the successive derivatives of the same um, invariant polynomials. These are the big operators. And we just take the subalgebra generated by them uh, over or uh, coefficient ring. And then uh, this was correct in the case of um, the adjoint representation. The, there we only had one more in the type A case, one more operator needed the, the second derivative of the of the of the third uh, uh, chern class. Um, so this is the big algebra. And then it was a long process until I could, we could prove with an um, intern over the summer that it is actually a commutative subalgebra. You can compute in a computer. That's what I did for several months with Fernandos. Uh, suggestion I used Magma, and uh, we managed to program this in the computer, and we had all these matrices, and, and they amazingly commuted, and they also had the right dimension. It was a cyclic subalgebra in the computer experiments up to SL6, I think, in, in big, big representations, thousand, five thousand dimensional matrices. We, it is always commuting, and uh, and then amazingly, even today, I don't have any kind of elementary proof that they commute. Um, let me first talk about that commutative property, because it, at the end of the day, it comes from something uh, quite um, deep and actually going back to the geometric elements, uh, construction of uh, Bayer's on and Greenfield related to that because it actually predates it. So it turns out that the big algebra so it comes from a universal big algebra sitting inside um, the tensor product of the symmetric algebra with the universal enveloping algebra. And it is actually what you can call they, some paper later, they call the golden algebra. This is the image of the Fagin Frankel center 
in the uh, fine vertex algebra at the critical level. And, um, and then it turns out to have a geometric Lagrange explanation. And, um, and this actually shows up in, in the paper of Baines and Dreyfeld, this big, big algebra. So our algebra should be thought all of them is somehow a, it's a image of this big, big commutative subalgebra. So that's the reason we know these communities. And then how do you prove cyclicity? And again, here we were lucky because uh, in a later work by Fagin, Frank, and Rignico, um, they, they don't really consider the whole Godin algebra, but only over elements and single element. And they show that this Godin algebra quantizes the mischenko fomenko system. But also they show that it is always for a regular element in the base. It's always a cyclic algebra. And then you can deduce it's a finite free algebra and therefore maximal. So basically, at the end of the day, although our um, algebra is very explicit and you can compute with it, it looks like the equivalent commodity or something. That's why I like to work with such things because basically that's what I compute all the time, like commodities of things. And um, but then it's quite deep in mathematics, which explains why it has the properties that we need. Okay, and then uh, let me finish with the geometrical picture. Which, uh, which you can use this algebra and which will uh, be actually even more enlightening because maybe still algebraic this Kiro algebra. So let me again list you some properties that you can just prove again by using other people's uh, computations. So it turns out that the big algebra is intimately related to the intersection homology of affine Schubert varieties. So we take the affine Grassmannian, okay, in this case of PGNN. And inside this, we will look at the singular, typically singular variety, the closure of this uh, orbit of the uh, group, uh, um, of, of this uh, uh, group on, uh, on the, um, the graphine, graphine, my name is called the Fine Schubert variety. This is our friend from earlier in the case of um, the um, fundamental representation. And this is the Grassmannian. And in general, this should be thought of as the space of, of you can do Hecke transformations at a given point of this type in you. And um, then again, now the, the both the cohomology ring of this equivariant cohomology ring and the um, intersection cohomology ring is a module over the cohomology ring is described um, explicitly by Bezu Pavlik of Finkelberg. They deduce it from the uh, geometric Satake. I, 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 the theorem of uh, of um, Mirkovic and Dinon and so Ginsburg had um, already several ideas uh, about exactly these kind of applications. For any new? For any new? This is a complete description. And then if you go there under the lead, you get uh, that basically all algebras are precisely these algebras. So the medium algebra, the center of the kilo algebra, is precisely the ordinary equivalent homology ring of the FI Schubert variety. You have to just unravel their description, their result. And then, more excitingly, I just realized recently that actually, their work you can interpret in other ways, and then you get that the endomorphism algebra of the intersection homology, the way how they describe that module, it gives you precisely the Kirillov algebra. So you can now think of the Kirillov algebra instead of abstract algebra, or in our case, it has to do with mirror symmetry, but it is a very nice topological meaning. It's the endomorphism algebra of the intersection quantity of the Alpha Schubert variety over the cohomology. And the center, of course, is just the, um, the um, ordinary cohomology itself. And now, because the big algebra is, um, is, a, is a cyclic, you can identify it with the, the intersection homology itself. And this way, as, as an MU mo mo module, the uh, big algebra will be precisely the intersection homology. And this way, what we get is a, is a graded uh, algebra structure on the intersection homology. This does not have a, a canonical product by topology, but in this particular case, we have a, some canonical uh, multiplication 
on the ring. So I should say that in the ordinary cohomology ring, the same was observed by um, the paper of Fagin, Frankel, and Rignico. This is the equivariant extension of that observation. But you will see that with the equivariant extension, we see actually much more the structure of the equivariant cohomology, equivariant intersection cohomology, or the actual the big algebra carries much more information than just the ordinary cohomology. And then you, the conjecture is that now you can put everything back and use this big algebra to describe the mirror of the um, of the universal uh, bundle in this uh, in this representation. So that's still outstanding because the varieties where you would have to compute are singular, and then it's it's kind of still non-trivial how to complete the picture. Okay, and let me finish uh, the whole uh, this, this uh, talk just by listing some properties and some interesting observations. So the first is that we always work with the explicit generators of the algebra, but in general, they don't exist. So it turns out in the work of Yakimova, who writes down this golden algebra, um, you can do explicit generators only in the classical types. And, and surprisingly, it matters which, uh, which generator set of the invariant polynomials you start with. So we are kind of lucky, although the ones you would take naturally for SLM, those two are, are known to be uh, living inside the Fabian Franca uh, algebra. But anyway, so it turns out that we don't yet have general. So that in the exceptional case types, we don't have generators. Of the algebra, except we have this abstract theory of vertex algebras, which gives us uh, this big algebra. It would be nice to be able to, and they conjecture as so Yakimova and her collaborators as a conjecture that uh, there is always some set of uh, generators of invariant polynomials whose uh, key will, I mean, in our work, in the theory of operators will generate the big algebra. Then what's very nice is what I mentioned already that you, the equivalent topology has much more structure because it's not just a fat point, it's a scheme over a, uh, an FI space. You can decompose it into irreducible components, the medium algebra, and then you can actually understand each, co each component of the medium algebra, which is the equivalent topology of some partial flat variety. You have some Vialinitsky um, Birula decomposition here. Anyway. And okay, that's some interesting thing only for the fixed people. Let me now go to the next one because this will be much more interesting. So I can take now this component of the medium algebra, and over this, there will be a component of the big algebra. And then this way, we can uh, define a graded ring structure on the intersection homology of this slice mm -hmm. to the FI Grassmannian. And, uh, and that's very interesting because, for example, this quantary polynomial is known to be the cash stick polynomial, but now we have a graded ring, um, finite dimensional graded ring, whose um, associated grade is the cash stick polynomial. Um, and again, you can start to try to compute it in the adjoint case. I, because of those other works, I think I can uh, explicitly compute it, but it's like a whole. Um, set of examples that you can try to compute, and you will get a great degree on this intersection homology. Um, for example, the zero weight will actually be, can be computed just by as the quotient of the big algebra by the augmentation ideal of the medium algebra. This somehow is a very interesting um, uh, sub algebra. Right. Then there will be a very nice uh, way to relate it to real forms of the group. And this is exciting because I believe this will make contact with the Leglands program for the real groups. You can, the Cartan motion of the real form will act on the big algebra. And I started to compute the invariant of the fixed point of the spectrum, that is the coin invariant algebra. And then it looks like a very non trivial and much more complicated than the original algebra. It should describe a real Higgs bundles, the fixed points of the Gartan evolution acting on the Higgs moduli space. And it should have to do with the Nabler uh, group, Nabler's PhD on the, on the real uh, geometric elements. 
and uh, I, I expect this song to 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 be um, again a very rich soil. So I'm just giving one example, and and the real form is a forged type. Then this one, this looks like a very simple um, involution by multiplying the minus one to the power of the degree. The degree gives us the cis direction, so it's just minus one of the cis direction. And then you can compute its uh, invariant polynomial. And it looks like very interesting. The dimension of this is the going to be the signature of the um, of the Hodge Riemann bilinear relation on the um, como, in the, in the intersection cohomology of the deducible representation. But this is some T deformation, T deformation of that plus you will have a ring. So this will be a very interesting object to compute. Anyway, there is a quantum version. Um, which is now very mysterious. I, I didn't uh, make this point uh, maybe clearly, but the this fagin Frankel thing, which uh, describes all or uh, big algebras, actually come from the actual geometric like that. So this is for them. It's about ring of functions on spaces of opers. But somehow for us, but they that's for them. It's the um, ramified version. So you have. Even sometimes I think they have irregular singularities. Everything is on P1 for them. So I don't see the geometric relation between our Higgs moduli spaces and their open spaces. But the funny thing is that here you can further quantize, and then you would get a quantum Kirillov algebra, and you would have a big universal quantum Kirillov algebra, which again is some sort of golden algebra. And, and that also should be commutative. But I don't know, we don't know what is the genetic meaning. You would think maybe some sort of quantum cohomology of these uh, uh, Schubert varieties, but it's more complicated than that. These quantum algebras are very hard to understand. Great, thank you. Yes. Um, so, yeah, quick question. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should be trying to do some thinking in the ordinary case, but it's more complicated. In, in that case, you have uh, multiple um, um, small resolutions. You could have different ring structures in the finite and um, atomistic case, so it's more complicated. But so in particular, a fine uh, Cardano is polynomial correspond to reduce the maybe reduce the modules of the of the algebra sorry could you repeat so this uh intersection homology is there as it irreducible over the kirino algebra the modules of the kirino algebra yes and what is it irreducible as a kind of simple model or some nice well, I don't yet know. I mean, we I started to think about this perspective in just a couple of days, but mm -hmm. but you are right. It will be uh, the intersection cohomology will be a module. Well, it's an endomorphism um, algebra over on the intersection cohomology, so it will act on it uh, by by uh, by this construction. But they are non commutative. So, and then what uh, now what we are thinking of that any, for example, anything you can do the same kind of construction for any singular space. You can take the ordinary cohomology of the singular variety, you can take the intersection cohomology, which will be a module over the ordinary cohomology, and you, you can look at the endomorphism algebra there. And why would you do that? Well, for me, because it's the analog of the Kirillo algebra, but also. If you have a, uh, um, um, you have a, a small resolution, then the ring structure there will give you um, a maximal cyclic commutative subalgebra of this endomorphism algebra. So you can actually put all these possible ring structures into the same non commutative algebra. So to any single space, you can think about the, um, this endomorphism algebra. Of the module of the ordinary cohomology and of intersection cohomology. And, and then you can think that cyclic subalgebras here should somehow be giving you ring structures on your intersection cohomology. But sometimes, for example, in the finite uh, Schubert variety case, you can have multiple uh, small resolutions 
which have non-isomorphic ring structures, but that means that they should still be inside the same endomorphism algebra. Then you can, I don't know, you can maybe classify all the cyclic subalgebras. In, in this case, I feel, or at least in some cases, I see there is a unique one, so you cannot uh, choose anything else. But they don't have small resolution, so these things uh, uh, the, the simplest case, I understand the joint representation, uh, you have only a semi-small resolution, a unique semi-small resolution of this both some and some resolution, but uh, we know that uh, uh, that our big algebra is not a subalgebra of the homogeneity of the resolution, so it's not uh, it cannot be seen there. But there is no small resolution, but we still have somehow in the, those cases that canonical ring structure on the intersection topology. All right, so maybe uh, thank uh, Tamash and Anton for a great talk. Thank you so much. So that is the end of our two days. Thank you, everybody online and still there. Uh, we'll put these things up uh, for uh, access later. All right.